All right, we saw that um, you had a series of small meetings. First, the Mount Vernon Conference organized by George Washington to deal with his plan of extending the Potomac River into the Ohio Territory. And he was uh, extremely gratified to see the cooperation that existed between the states of Maryland, uh, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Now, you had, following that, in 1786, you had a uh, Annapolis Convention. Only six states showed up, but two big heavyweights were there, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. They both realized that the Articles of Confederation were going to have to be abolished, but that states would not uh, countenance that. So they called for a meeting in Philadelphia for June of 1787. And at that meeting, the articles should be repaired. They should be reorganized. Thus uh, avoiding the idea, however, it's exactly what was going to happen, that the articles be abolished. So people then set about organizing what this convention was going to look like, who they were, well, we've taken a look at some of the people who wanted a strong national government and those who preferred it the way it was. You had merchants, planners, uh, and others with, with financial interest to protect Washington, for example, as one of the largest Western landholders out there, all right? Various professional classes, be they doctors or lawyers, and people who saw this as a way of gaining political favor with certain groups. Take a look at what the final number of 55 was comprised of. Mostly lawyers, three doctors, seven former governors of their own states, six plantation owners, and eight major businessmen, all of the upper class. In terms of ages, the youngest would be, if I remember correctly, age 20 from New Jersey. The oldest would be Ben Franklin from Pennsylvania, who by this time was in his 80s. So the snapshot of a framer, white, owner of property, and male. So obviously not a diverse group, uh, not one that uh, looked like they were going to be in favor of a pure democracy. The agenda well, it depended on who you were. Some wanted a strong central government. Others wanted to present or prevent excessive democracy, giving too much power to the lower groups. Others wanted to limit the influence of radicals. And of course, they are the ones that were in favor of excessive democracy. But above all, to gain the popular support of all the people within the 13 states. For this to work, it was going to have to be unanimous. Compromise, why? Well, you can see the reasons up there. Everybody was protecting their own self-interest, so they all wanted that piece of the pie. They were afraid of a totally uh, powerful central government. And again, you can understand that when you take a look at what they fought against in order to get to this particular point. And equality versus inequality. They all recognized that certain groups were not participating in this great experiment. So how to avoid that while at the same time avoiding excessive democracy. So it was in each and every uh, group that comprised this convention uh, to compromise, to get a little bit of what they wanted. For four hot months during that year, those delegates debated, argued, and compromised. Some left, some did not even attend. Rhode Island was the single abstainer, so in truth, representatives from only 12 states contributed to the formation of the Constitution. In the end, there were 40 men who had seen it through to the end. Those 40 men are considered to be the founding fathers of this country. Now, remember, originally started out with 55. Uh, give you an example. Alexander Hamilton was there in the beginning, 
but he left before it ended uh, in order to work on getting New York's approval for the Constitution, which he felt uh, satisfied that it would pass without him. Now, the entire document is called a great compromise because when you look at all the different uh, attitudes that were represented, all the different theories of political thought that was included in that, it truly is a great compromise. But one of the things they did not compromise on was the importance of George Washington. Washington initially did not want to attend the convention. James Madison and others, including Jefferson, who was away in France, realized that for this convention to have any success in terms of getting the support of the people in all the states, Washington had to be a part of it. So he was hounded by Madison and a few others to go. And eventually they appealed to his ego saying that if this does not work, then they will look back on the fact that you were absent. So Washington agrees to go. He goes, and it was a foregone conclusion that he was going to be the chairman of the overall convention. He will propose that all of the proceedings within that convention take place in absolute secrecy. No official records will be kept, no uh, breathing a word of this to the newspapers, even though it was in the middle of the hot summers in Philadelphia, all the windows were closed so that nobody could stand outside and listen. The reason behind secrecy, well, it's simple. Then men could vote their conscience and not worry about pressure from the outside. They could do the right thing as opposed to doing the political thing. It came from James Madison, who has been called the father of the Constitution. His plan for a government called for a chief executive the president, a national judiciary, the Supreme Court, and a legislature, the Congress. Now, that uh, template, which Madison used to uh, eventually abolish the Articles of Confederation, the, the system for, by which, of course, we're governed today, that is nothing new. Uh, you take a look at the gentleman we mentioned before, Montesquieu, Rousseau, Locke, etc., they uh, had talked about three branches of government and this idea of checks and balances. As a matter of fact, you can go back to Greek times. Uh, Plato played around with that type of government. So again, this was nothing new, but this was the first time that it was going to be seriously attempted. But the first plan would be how the states would be represented within this government. You see Madison's plan, often known as the Virginia plan. It would be presented to Congress or to the convention, I should say, by the governor of Virginia at that time, the highly respected Edmund Randolph, who ironically, uh, later on to jump ahead, would be against the Constitution. And only at the last minute would he be persuaded to give his support to it. Anyway, as you see there, the Virginia plan said, the representation would be based on population. So the larger the state, the more representatives they had. Called for two houses. Of course, what we have today, the Senate and the House of Representatives. Now, as you can see there, the criticisms, well, the biggest one was it catered to the big states and it provided no central leadership. This would be countered by Coming from the Soprano State, the New Jersey plan. William Patterson, after whom, of course, Patterson, New Jersey is named after, his plan was a simple one, just one house, and every state would get just one vote but there would be a chief executive, a president, mainly as we know it today. Now you can see the criticisms. Again, this gave Delaware the same amount of power as Massachusetts and Rhode Island the same amount of power as Virginia. And as many people said, too similar to the articles. So 
This was a stalemate and a rather emotional one. The larger states proceed as if we were blind. Now, Mr. Madison insists that the large states will never hit the small states if we give up our equality in the Senate. But I do not trust you, sir. Let the large states do as they like. There are other recourses for the smaller states. We can find some foreign ally, someone of, of more honor and good faith who will take us by the hand and do us justice. What Mr. Bedford has spoken is treason. Whatever may be my distress, I will not let Coach Reggie for a foreign power. Recognizes Dr. Franklin. So you can see the emotion that was attached to this. And the end? Well, you see what Governor Morris from Pennsylvania said. This country must be united. If persuasion does not unite us, the sword will, and the gallows and the halter will finish the work of the sword. So We are in danger of splitting up and splitting up violently. One of the very problems and uh, criticisms that we face today. The compromise that works all this out will be provided by, once again, somebody from Connecticut. I think. called the Connecticut Compromise or the Great Compromise. Now, don't get confused. I mentioned earlier on the, the Constitution itself is called a Great Compromise, but this is the Great Compromise, the Connecticut Compromise, created by Roger Sherman, who was one of the original authors of the Articles of Confederation. And what he proposed is exactly what we have today. We will have a bicameral legislature, two houses, one being the Senate, the other being the House of Representatives. One by population, the other everybody gets to regardless. The Senate was deemed to be the more prestigious and more powerful of the two. So in that one, everybody gets two representatives regardless of the size of the state. The House would be proportional representation, but all money matters must originate in the house. So again, making sure that uh, taxes and, and, and other economic matters get decided by the representatives of the people. And of course, as we all know, it would be accepted. The Connecticut Compromise is the basis for that. But they does use the term chief executive. This is one of the awkward moments in the Constitutional Convention. Uh, when they finally start discussing the chief executive, uh, you have a, uh, a duality there. And what I mean by that is they all knew to a man that the person that would be that chief executive was going to be George Washington. And... Uh, there are many historians that believe that even Washington knew it, though uh, perhaps he feigned uh, a lack of interest in it during the convention and after. Be that as it may, uh, and oftentimes they criticize the, uh, the way the chief executive was being structured within the Constitution because they feared a dictator. But at the same time, they knew that quote unquote dictator was going to be George Washington. So uh, this, this proved for some rather awkward moments during the convention. So there we are, the Great Compromise. Pennsylvania with a population of 430, New Jersey with a population of 180, would each have two senators. But that wasn't the end of the representation controversy because the South, well, they have their own problem. Because what they found is that 
in some states, South Carolina being one of them, there were more slaves than there were white males. And that is what counted for representation. So how could they even that up? Eventually comes the three-fifths compromise. And as you see there, calculate the number of slaves by each state and multiply by 60%. You take that number, add it to the white population. This is going to give the South much more representation than they actually deserved and gave them a great deal of power. You're going to find that this government will be dominated by Southerners. Uh, four of the first five presidents were slaveholders. The majority of the Supreme Court later on will be slaveholders. Most of the chairs of the various powerful committees in Congress in both branches, or both houses, would be slaveholders. So as you see there, they're going to hold 33 to 45 percent of the seats in Congress. And that uh, is one of the reasons why as slavery was uh, looked upon to be uh, dissolved uh, as time went on, they resented this and fought against it, eventually resulting, of course, as we know, in the Civil War. There you see Representative Luther Martin laid bare the savage irony of the situation. We opposed Great Britain's attempt to enslave us, and yet we will make sure the Constitution protects slavery. Madison himself, a slaveholder, says, great as the evil is, a dismemberment of the Union would be worse. And so slavery would be accepted. Again, uh, the ends justifies the means. So the three-fifths compromise and others, which were silently slipped into the Constitution, will protect slavery, though slavery itself is never mentioned in the Constitution. Controversy number two, trade regulation. Should the central government control trade and should they stop the slave trade? The South, they were afraid that there would be taxation and they deemed slavery still necessary. What comes is known as the commercial compromise. They will allow the slave trade to continue for 20 years to end in 1807. Congress would regulate all trade coming into and going out of the country. However, there would be no export taxes, taxes on goods that we sent out of the country. Congress would also regulate internal trade between states, interstate trade. Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution is considered by many to be the most important because what Article 10 did away with was each state printing up its own money. And it gave Congress, as you see there, the power to directly control all treaties with foreign nations, not with any individual states. States are prohibited from passing laws that assign guilt that makes something illegal retroactively or interferes with contracts. No state may collect taxes on imports or exports build its own army or keep warships. So power is being concentrated in the federal government. States cannot make their own money nor can they grant any title of nobility. Treaties, two thirds of the Senate must be present. So this all results <laughs> There are some people who may call this a three-ring circus. Montesquieu, one of the enlightened philosophers, 
of that time is one of the ones who pushed this idea. Now, again, he was dead by the time this all happened, but oftentimes this idea is relegated to him. Next. Constitution is deemed to be the supreme law of the land. Now, uh, that is rather solid in terms of what it means, but it would be argued and debated numerous times before the Supreme Court. And, of course, eventually, you'll find the South leaving the Union in 1861 because they could not accept this. Now, remember one of the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation was it basically was unamendable. That was dealt with um, when they came up with the idea of how amendments could be attached to the Constitution. And if there was something that should be changed, well, there was a means for proposal. We have had since, of course, 1787, 27 amendments. There have been over 6,000 proposals. So obviously, this is not something that can be done capriciously or easily, but yet it can be done. So built into the Constitution, what was its ability to change? As... Franklin would refer to this as the great experiment. Again, I'm going to go back to something I said in the first lecture. These individuals had very little experience in doing something like this. They were taking a composite of various ideas and putting them together in one charter, if you will, the Constitution. Take a look. If you've been to Independence Hall, that is the only original piece of furniture still in Independence Hall. It is a chair. I'm going to go back to the previous painting. The chair that Washington sat in as he was the chairman of the Constitutional Convention. As the individual stepped forward to sign the Constitution, Franklin was rumored to have said, ah, the chair, the sun is either setting or rising on this noble experiment. I prefer to think that it is a rising sun. The compromise report of the Grand Committee was approved. A key issue of the convention was decided. During the next eight hot, humid weeks, the House debated, amended, and approved the other resolutions of the Virginia Plan and General Assembly. A committee of style refined the language of the new Constitution. I am especially fond of the preamble, not we the states, but we the people. This shows to all the world that in America, the people will govern. This body is now ready to vote in General Assembly. Major Jackson, will now read the final draft of the Constitution of the United States. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Article 1, Section 1. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in the Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. The House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen by The executive power shall be vested in the President of the United States of America. He shall hold his office during the term of four years, together with the Vice President's dominions. The judicial
judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court, and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time not be convened against domestic violence. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or on the application of the legislature of two-thirds of the several forces shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. The senators and representatives before me to support this Constitution, but no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. The ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution before the states. Done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states present, the 17th day of September in the year of our Lord, 1787, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 12th. Thank you, Major Taylor. Now, there are a couple of things in there. We the people, and the power shall derive its from the people. And yet, one of the compromises that was put into that original constitution was something that's caused a great deal of controversy this past year, and that is the electoral college. Because initially, the founding fathers did not trust the people to elect the proper representatives or in this case, the president of the United States. And that's why an electoral college was collected and put together by those individuals. These were supposed to be these electors, the best and the brightest, who will from among possible candidates select the best and the brightest. Now, this great experiment would be continued, as Dr. Franklin said, as he walked out of convention hall to a lady who came up to him and said, well, Dr. Franklin, do we have a republic? And again, he's rumored to have said, you have a republic if you can keep it. Words that still ring true today. We have a republic if we can keep it. But now, perhaps just as difficult as putting together that constitution, would be this, getting the states to approve it. And there was an organized opposition to this constitution. And there were some key states. And what everybody uh, believed, though nobody dare say it publicly, was even though they required just nine states to approve the constitution that would govern everybody, most people knew Hamilton and Madison among them and Washington, it better be unanimous. What good would it be if a state in the middle of the country, such as for argument's sake, Pennsylvania or Virginia voted no? How could this nation exist? So conventions throughout the states would be held to decide whether or not to adopt the constitution. Arguing in favor of it, would be a series of essays written by Hamilton, Jay, and Madison, uh, some 75 in all, known as the Federalist Papers. They would be published in newspapers. Of the 75, close to 60 would be written by Hamilton. Jay would write three, and the rest would be uh, written by Madison. All of them answering critiques of the uh, Constitution. The biggest complaint was that it contained no protection of individual rights. Even Jefferson said without that, he could not give his support. Again, from far off France. One of the leaders against the Constitution in a key state, namely Virginia, would be Patrick Henry. Henry was going to try to talk it to death. To death. He was the most uh, renowned orator throughout the colonies. People would travel hundreds of miles just to hear him speak. He is the man, of course, who said, as for others, I know not what they do, but as for me, 
give me liberty or give me death, which became one of the watch phrases of the revolution. Now, he was going to attempt to play the slavery card, meaning he was going to show that under the auspices of the Constitution, how easily slavery could be done away with. Fortunately, in the background, you had Washington and Madison, who eventually prevail upon Edmund Randolph, governor of Virginia, to support the uh, Constitution, and it barely squeaks by in Virginia. The same will happen in Massachusetts, and the same will happen in New York. Deals are struck. As you see, Alexander Hamilton said, it has been frequently remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country by their conduct and example to decide the important question, whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. The irony is Hamilton was one of the ones that did not trust the everyday people. Hamilton is one of the ones that pushed for an electoral college. Hamilton uh, pushed for some other things that were uh, very similar to things that took place in the English form of government. Virginia approves and now New York. And Hamilton again make some deals behind the scenes. What could I do to top this? One of the deals to top this to ensure ratification would be the promise that once the new government is in place, that a bill of rights, as we know now today, the 10 first 10 amendments to the constitution will be added to the existing constitution. Actually, the man who writes the Bill of Rights as we know them today is James Madison. Madison writes somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 amendments. And of course we know that only 10 will be approved. And so constitution is now ratified. And now that constitution will become the governing document, but not so easy and not so fast. Now, all the nuts and bolts have to be put in place. The format is there. The diagram is there. Now will come the people who will be the first ones to inhabit the offices that are prescribed by the Constitution. And again, they have no guidelines which to follow. They have no previous examples. This is Again, to use the phrase, a new experiment, a republic if we can keep it. And as we're going to see, much of it is going to lie on the broad shoulders of George Washington.